The content of this video is for educational purposes. Any decision to revise one's clinical practice is the sole responsibility of the individual clinician. Department of Anesthesia, you will primarily see me either at the Children's Hospital or in, if you come visit in Kenya. And I just want to thank you to Matt McAvoy. He's allowed me to introduce our speakers today. I've been looking forward to this uh, talk for uh, many months. So our presenters today are representing the Vanderbilt Children's Hospital Pediatric Pain Service, which is led by Dr. Drew Franklin. Matt Kynes joined the group after completing his Pediatric Anesthesiology Fellowship at Vanderbilt in 2016. Jenna Sobey also completed Pediatric Anesthesiology Training at Vanderbilt and has been with the Pain Service since 2014 and is also the, the current Pediatric Anesthesia Fellowship Director. Twyla Luckett has been a nurse at Vanderbilt for 32 years and has been the Pain Service nurse since it started 15 years ago. They would also like to recognize the major contribution of Stephen Duo Machai, who's a KRNA at Kajabi Hospital. And he's also one of the education directors for the KRNA program there in Kenya, who, who, wouldn't who won't present with them today, but is integral to the project, that, and they will discuss it uh, today. He is on the call today, so welcome, Steve. They will be speaking this morning about the combined efforts with Kajabi Hospital in Kenya to identify local solutions to the global pain problem. Thank you, uh, team. Go, thank you, Matt. I'll let you go ahead from this point. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate the introduction. Um, yeah. And also appreciate uh, everything that you've done to make this type of work. Um, just want to start. These are the learning objectives. I won't go through them, but they were emailed out earlier to refer to. And then mention that um, some of the funding uh, for the projects we'll be talking about was um, provided by uh, Vanderbilt International Anesthesia Grant. Um, I want to start this talk by uh, talking about this man. This is Eliud Kipchoge, who's a Kenyan marathon runner and is the fastest distance runner in the world. Um, as many of you probably know, marathon running is a national pastime and a point of pride in Kenya. Anyone who's run a major marathon has probably seen the group of Kenyan runners blazing around the course. Um, you may also have heard this news last year about his incredible athletic achievement. Um, in December of last year, he became the first person to run a marathon in less than two hours. Uh, this was an average of four minutes, 30 seconds uh, per mile, which means that by the end, end of this talk, he will have completed uh, a half marathon. Um, it's an incredible achievement, and I think his story is instructive. While his determination and his talent are incredible, uh, it's really not the story of one man running alone. In fact, uh, he was asked about his achievement and he said, there's a formula, 100% of me is nothing compared to 1% of the whole team. Um, and in fact, Kip Choge was supported by an extensive team of athletes, exercise scientists, nutritionists, psychologists, trainers, statisticians, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, as well as marketers, um, with the explicit goal of running a marathon in less than two hours. Um, this included physiometric testing to identify Kipchoge and other runners to run with him, statistical analysis to lay out his race and training plan, shoe design by Nike, of course, uh, to increase his running economy, um, nutrition, optimization, uh, a Tesla driving around the course, pacing his uh, rate to the second. Um, pace runners, some of the best in the world, guiding him around the course and then choosing the ideal course on the ideal day to make this happen. Um, I think it illustrates the idea that accomplishing incredible, incredible goals is never the result of a single individual. And it does require meticulous planning, fueled by a growth mindset that explores and studies all of the available options for a chance to improve. And that's what we do every day here at Vanderbilt as a team of anesthesiologists, nurse anesthetists, residents, students, researchers to care for our patients. Similarly, just as Kipchoge's achievement required a team effort, 
So achieving audacious goals in a field like global health requires the combined efforts of a committed team. And that's really what we're here to talk about today. This is our course that we'll be running today. Um, start talking about the problem of global pain, talk about why this is a particular issue in low and middle income countries, talk about some improvement strategies, and then shift to looking at how some of these improvement strategies are being applied at Kajabe Hospital in Kenya. Um, we'll present some of the pre preliminary results from work we've uh, started there. Um, with partners and then finish with some concluding remarks. Let's start with some common definitions. Um, pain has been around obviously since um, people have, um, but somehow there was a new definition of pain released just this past year from the International Association for the Study of Pain. And I've put it here, an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience with associated, associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. The IASP emphasized six key points about this definition. Number one, that pain is influenced by social, biological, and psychological factors. Number two, that pain cannot be inferred from the activity of sensory neurons alone. Number three, that life experiences have a major influence on pain and pain perception. Number four, that a person's report of pain should always be respected, although it does not always have to be believed. Um, number five, five, that pain is usually adaptive, but may also have adverse effects on function and social and psychological well-being. Um, and then finally, that the inability to communicate does not negate the possibility that a person experiences pain. The global burden of pain, both acute and chronic, is large and growing, and I'll talk about that for a couple of slides here. The incidence is estimated as high as one in five adults affected by chronic moderate to severe pain. Um, it happens commonly after surgery and trauma with more than 50% of patients having severe or intolerable pain. Um, a lot of this pain is around cancer uh, diagnoses, but operations and injuries contribute a significant proportion of chronic pain as well. This of course has a huge economic impact. Um, the financial cost related to pain is comparable to cancer or cardiovascular disease with 550 to $635 billion spent or lost due to pain each year. Um, and it also has a, a huge social impact. Um, one half to two thirds of people experiencing this type of pain are unable to do the activities that they would desire to or need to. The uh, Global Burden of Disease study documents uh, the major causes of death and disability worldwide. Um, and uh, a recent publication showed that three of the top 10 causes of years lost to disability um, from this study group are pain related, um, with a fourth major depression contributing significant overlay to these issues. Um, together, these causes of um, disability account for 130 million years lost to disability each year. Remarkably, if you look at those causes from 1990 to the leading causes uh, today, uh, these pain-related causes have remained relatively unchanged. The uh, World Health Organization estimates that 5.5 billion people do not have adequate access to, to treatments for moderate to severe pain. And just like many other areas of healthcare and development, the bulk of the burden of pain is borne by people living in low and middle income countries. This map from World Bank um, shows countries shaded red, orange, and yellow that would be considered low and middle income countries. And there are a lot of people represented in these countries that um, have limited access to pain and pain to pain management. <clears throat> Shifting now to talking about some details about what we know about pain in LMICs. The best study to date regarding the extent of pain in LMICs came out of Vanderbilt, actually, in 2016, led by Tracy Jackson, uh, Kelly McQueen, and others. They did a meta-analysis of 120 studies um, from LMICs looking at non-cancer, non-injury pain, and identified a rate of 34%. Um, this was more common in elderly um, people and workers. Um, 
and probably underestimates the total amount of pain being experienced on a regular basis because it didn't include cancer, injuries, HIV, or other identifiable causes of pain. You see here uh, displayed some of the ranges of incidents for different types of pain, headache, abdominal pain, low back pain, all with incredibly high uh, rates uh, in these settings. Of course, our own John Wanderer created an excellent infographic describing some of these studies. Um, and here displays the range of countries and locations that these studies came from, um, just showing that they represent a wide swath of the low and middle income world. Uh, the team at Vanderbilt has also developed a global pain survey to further describe the incidence and severity of pain in LMICs. This is led by Jenna Walters, Tracy Kelly, and others. And uh, this survey incorporate, incorporated several standardized and cross-culturally validated metrics into a survey that can be used in different settings um, with a sample population to get an idea for what the incidence and severity of pain in these settings is. Um, it has been performed in, in India and Nepal, showing a point prevalence of pain ranging from 24 to 50 percent. Um, pain disability affecting daily life in six to 10 out of the last 30 days on average, and 10 to 11% of respondents reporting pain in more than one site. It's also been uh, done and published from Mozambique led by Camilla Walters. Um, and it's that uh, study showed a pain, um, incidence of pain every day for more than six months of 39% with a 52% point prev prevalence of pain among respondents. Notably, that study also mentioned that um, people were willing to pay a high amount and travel a far distance to uh, get some type of treatment or relief from their pain. Uh, this survey is actually being performed in Guatemala and Liberia now, um, and so we'll have more details soon about what pain and pain management looks like in these settings. I'll move on to a couple of key subgroups in pain um, for LMIC, starting with pediatric pain. Um, our group uh, recently made an effort to characterize current data in LMICs um, for pediatric pain. And um, while there are several estimates that could be made, um, including an estimate of 20 to 35 percent of children experiencing some form of chronic pain, you see these wide intervals um, show that really there's not enough data to draw solid conclusions about the incidence of chronic pain in pediatrics in LMICs, although it is an issue. Similarly, data both on both acute and chronic post-surgical pain in LMICs is limited, uh, but there is some evidence that it is a significant pro problem as well. Um, one example is a report from a Nigerian teaching hospital looking at post-operative pain, and uh, they reported that 69% of patients had moderate to unbearable pain at 24 hours and 52% at 48 hours. Um, what we do know is that the ability of clinicians in these settings to manage this um, in LMICs is often extremely limited. Um, this is a study um, published by Greg Sund, who, by the way, is a new anesthesiologist at Kajabi Hospital, who some of you will get to know. He was reporting from a hospital in Burundi about post-surgical pain management um, and said that most patients in that setting undergoing major surgery, including laparotomy, C-section, or intramedullary fracture fixation, received only intermittent paracetamol for post-operative analgesia. And these green bars on the figure you can see post-operative pain management um, before an intervention to try and improve it consisted really of paracetamol or spinal morphine given in the operating room, which of course has limited utility. This does have serious short and long-term implications. Um, there is some evidence that for every 10% increase in the time spent in severe post-operative pain, there's a 30% increase in chronic pain 12 months after surgery. So pain incidence and management is a problem globally and significantly in LMICs. I want to move to talk about some of the reasons why this is the case. Um, one framework to think about how, uh, these issues is borrowed from a renowned global health leader 
an advocate and founder of Partners in Health, uh, Paul Farmer. Um, he uses a framework, just uh, very simple staff, meaning properly trained and compensated doctors, nurses, community health workers, stuff, meaning you know, medical, medical equipment, supplies, and drugs, um, space, meaning a clean and sanitary environment, for treating patients, and systems, meaning um, inf infrastructure and logistical organization to accomplish pain um, management or really address any issue related to healthcare delivery. Um, so let's explore some of these as they relate to pain. At a basic level, diagnosing and managing pain requires trained clinicians. It's very simple, but in many LMICs, nursing staff and other providers are very limited um, and ratios of staff to patients or population are extremely high. There is a vicious cycle of fewer trainers available, fewer educators, more demand and work placed on the educators and providers who are there leading to decreased morale and the potential of immigration or shifting away from those settings, making the problem worse in a, in a vicious cycle. Um, this is true for nursing. It's been true for um, physicians as well. Specialists who are important for education and leadership are also scarce in many of these settings. Um, the incidence or numbers of pain or palliative care physicians are extremely low. In Mozambique, there are only two physicians and two nurses with spe specialized pain training, working in four clinics for the country. In Zimbabwe, there's a report of only one chronic and one palliative care specialist. And at the bottom, there's a figure representing the ratio of palliative care specialist to population in three countries, in the UK, which is one to 43,000 people, in Kenya, which is one to four million people, and in Pakistan, which is one for every 158 million people, which is obviously not enough. These same challenges hold true for anesthesiologists and anesthetists, and that's been described in the World Federation of Societies for Anesthesia Global Anesthesia Workforce Survey, which was done in 2017. You see in these countries represented in red, orange, and yellow, very limited numbers of anesthesia providers per population. Um, just putting that in context, here in the US, there are over 20 um, physician anesthesiologists per 100,000 people, and in Kenya, it's far less than one. Uh, the numbers for non-physician anesthetists um, and other anesthesia providers are higher, but still extremely um, limited and not enough to treat the uh, surgical disease in those countries. I'll move from staff to stuff. Um, so in addition to the tools and equipment necessary to intervene for pain, um, basic things like analgesics are unavailable or scarce in many parts of the world. This figure shows morphine equivalents given per patient in need of palliative care um, with size representing the proportion given. So you can see the USA, Canada are very fat in terms of the amount of medication provided. And some countries or even continents, South America, Africa, Southeast Asia, are, are barely even registering in terms of the amount of uh, opioid that they're able to provide. This has been termed the excess abyss um, with uh, extremely low percentage of the world's total opioid um, supply going to patients and people in low and middle income countries, as low as 6% of the total supply being available in those settings. Just to illustrate that in another way, um, the, uh, I know the text is small, but the point of this slide is that here at Vanderbilt, post-operative pain has a huge number of analgesics available to help manage. Um, at Kajabe, the formula formulary there is more limited, although actually very good for that setting. And then um, what's more characteristic of pain management in many district and rural hospitals is the WHO essential medicines list of analgesics, uh, which is only a handful of um, medications that would be available. Many places are dealing with much less. Let's talk a couple minutes about systems that are barriers to providing effective pain management in low and middle income countries. 
First is a, a low prioritization of pain control globally. Um, global health focus is often focused on communicable disease like HIV, malaria, TB, or nutrition. It's also generally been um, applied to life-saving treatments over life-improving treatments. Um, this has been described as socialization for scarcity, meaning that when there's not enough money or funding to go around, uh, you need to pick and choose the things that you'd like. Although uh, the goal, of course, is to be able to provide a high level care of care in all areas for patients all over the world. Other issues related to systems may be outdated or incorrect attitudes about pain management, uh, research systems deficits leading to blind spots um, in the medical community about the extent and issues of pain control in LMICs, the lack of context sensitive interventions. Um, what works here in the US may not work in Kenya or elsewhere in LMICs. Um, I think of the idiom in medicine, when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. Well, that's not true in Kenya. Um, and so we need to think about how to make interventions that make sense um, in the settings where we're working. Finally, there are patient expectations driven by culture or resource limitations that do affect all of these systems and need to be addressed. So why does this matter to us as anesthesia providers concerned about global health? Well, the surgical burden of disease makes up a large and largely untreated component of the global burden of disease, estimated at 30%, um, with 17 million avertable deaths per year related to surgical conditions. Um, another way of putting this, in 2015, um, the Lancet Commission published uh, a major study describing the state of surgery, surgical care worldwide they identified 230 million procedures performed annually with only 3.5% of those in LMICs, leaving a surgical gap in those countries of 143 million surgeries each year. Um, as that gap is closed, there will be an increasing need for adequate and appropriate pain control in those settings, leading to what some have called a rising wave of pain in the coming years. Uh, Dr. Walters, Jackson, Queen um, describe this as LMICs begin to struggle to meet the demands of growing surgical volume. It is essential that strategies for perioperative pain management be included in the perioperative assessment. So what might some of these strategies be? I'll divide this into two buckets quickly, education strategies and advocacy, and give a few examples for each. So, Education efforts. Um, one basic example was the WHO analgesic ladder introduced first in 1986. Very simple system for addressing persistent pain and it's been applied in other areas. And a prime example of broad scale education related to pain management. Um, at a specialist level, the WFSA started um, anesthesia related fellowships in 1996 and now has several pain and regional fellowships spread around the world. And then finally, I'll mention the emergence of short courses for multidisciplinary providers um, addressing issues related to pain. The uh, most frequent and well-established course is Essential Pain Management, which we'll talk about later. It's been performed in 55 countries since 2010. It's a two-day curriculum and includes training of trainers who can then um, provide that curriculum elsewhere. Steve Machai, I mentioned earlier, has been uh, teaching this and plans to teach this at Kajabi Hospital as part of an initiative there that we'll describe. A couple examples of advocacy. The uh, IASP has been heavily involved in this, not only through uh, the journal Pain, which uh, advocates for research and publishes research related to pain and pain management, but also um, raises attention each year in pain related topics through their global year campaigns. And at a high level, government pressure and advocacy to improve analgesic supply and prioritize that as a mission for global healthcare. Um, this, uh, two examples of this in 2014. The World Health Assembly passed the resolution mentioning palliative care as a component of healthcare. And then in 2015, 
passed a resolution emphasizing emergency and essential surgical care, specifically mentioning um, improved access to opioids and other analgesics to address problems related to that. So as these initiatives continue to grow, often in um, conjunction with universal health care plans or national surgical anesthesia and obstetric plans, um, they will help to bring uh, widespread attention to the needs for acute and chronic pain management in these settings. Here's our CME code that will be displayed on the rest of the slides for the talk. And I want to hand things over to Jenna, who's going to talk about a current project to partner with Kajabe Hospital to improve pain management there. Hey, Jenna, could you unmute? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matt. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak with you all today. Um, as Matt has been able to demonstrate so far in our talk, there truly is a need to address undertreated pain in the perioperative arena, as well as chronic pain. Today, we're going to be specifically focusing on that perioperative time frame. So how can we as anesthesiologists that work here at Vanderbilt and in the U.S. be of service to help assist these, this initiative in low and middle income countries? Well, we were very fortunate to travel to the AIC Kajabi Hospital to really look at it like a case study and determine what the needs were there. Many of you all are familiar uh, with- Adjust your screen so we can see you. Sorry about that. Thank you. Is that better? You can tip it up, there you go. Yes. Sorry, <laughs> thank you. Um, as I mentioned, many of us are familiar with the AIC Kajabi Hospital, but for those that are not, it was founded in uh, 1915 and it expanded in the 1960s. Um, now they've added a pediatric wing and it has a 360 bed capacity with nine operating theaters it has a five bed adult ICU and now has a six bed pediatric ICU. It also has a very busy emergency room and a fully functional lab and pathology department. Um, it is a level five tertiary referral hospital and a majority of the patients that are treated at Kajabi Hospital travel, travel from all over Kenya just to receive care there because it is so well known for its quality of physicians and the quality of care that's provided. So Matt, myself, and Twyla were able to go last summer, and it really was a privilege to have the opportunity. We worked closely once we arrived with a multidisciplinary core group. This group included um, KRNAs, which is the CRNA equivalent at Kajabi Hospital. We also worked closely with the surgeons, and then most importantly, the nursing staff, the ward nurses, as well as some of the nursing leadership. We needed to find the best way to assess the patient experience and nurses' understanding of pain management practices there. And now I'm just going to reintroduce Twyla Luckett. Again, she has been at Vanderbilt for more than 32 years as a nurse. She joined the pediatric pain team when it was begun in 2005, and she has a wealth of information regarding pain management, but also nursing and I'm going to let her share what our observations were when we were able to share with these nurses on the boards. Twyla? Thank you, Jenna. Yeah, I, um, I am grateful to have been a part of this process and um, I thank you for that introduction and being able to be a part of Grand Rounds, but specifically this, this initiative. Um, people that know me know I'm really passionate about nursing and I am passionate about pain care, but nurses do influence change and they absolutely uh, enhance an organization's culture and they can reshape the way care is delivered. And so it's important, so important to have nurses that are strong leaders, even at the bedside, who are willing to advocate for those patients. So I get to take a break from the graphs and the data and uh, some of that today and just do the fun part of that and uh, talk today. And I'm just going to talk with you about the observations that I had Specifically, uh, as Jenna mentioned, we sat down with the team of key stakeholders when we got there and really got to hear from them what their concerns were and how we could help them. 
And my focus while I was on the nursing staff, uh, you know that it really involves having a multiple viewpoints, multiple disciplines that come together to create change is the best way to do that. And I was able to spend time after we broke out of this meeting and hearing their concerns with the nurses from the various wards and uh, holding room and PACU and the surgical areas. And anytime you go in, I feel like as a consultant or just as a personal leader, you want to focus, you're there to help them see where they can change, but you also want to focus on things that they do well. You know, what are their strengths? And I felt like one of the biggest strengths that they have at Kajabi is their attitude. They have an amazing um, attitude about it. They were welcoming, they were kind, and you might wonder why that's a strength, but if you want to help someone and they don't want your help, nothing is going to be successful, right? So that was a big, big part of um, something I felt like we could build upon. They were eager to learn, and I love this picture that I show here where all the nurses are gathered around this pediatric patient. It was infectious. When you got those nurses who were starting to engage with their patients and talk with them and they understood what a pain scale was and how to use it, it's things that we take for granted and are simple, but it makes such a big difference in that patient. And so it was great to see them interact with them in that way. It's a big part of their care. In the US, I feel like we focus on all these systems, neuro, cardiac, respiratory, GIGU, but so many times the spiritual aspect, the psychological aspect of that gets swept under the rug. And when chronic pain or acute pain that's left untreated, it begins to impact your quality of life. You know, they don't, they don't have a good, uh, good day-to-day -day life with that and they can't meet their goals. And so that's a, it's a strength that they have that they focus on that, but it's certainly an area that we could, we could grow from too uh, and learn even here in the States. They had a good selection of medicines. I was surprised at the medicines they had available. As Matt showed on the screen earlier, it's certainly not what we have. It's more than other places had, but it was a great foundation, good place to start. And I found that encouraging because you can help build something on a plan that is sustainable there if you know what they have available to them and you have a good mix of both non-opioid and adjuncts that you can pull from to hopefully lessen that opioid requirement. In terms of the structure, uh, just like here, you have nursing leaders, you have staff nurses, you have physician leadership as well, but there was a disconnect between the two. So many times the nurses weren't sure who to call um, and if they had the number to call, they would call and this person would be in surgery or they wouldn't call them back. And so not knowing who to go to next was a big void for them. And so the patient could wait hours, potentially even till the end of the shift and some days I was there to get the care that they needed. That's just not acceptable. And that um, is a big challenge that we faced. Staffing, high nurse patient ratio, extremely high, very young nursing staff overall, uh, three to five years experience for the most part. And with that, you can find people that are in over their head really really quickly. They don't know how to advocate. They don't know the words to use. They weren't sure how to even complete a pain assessment past a score. And as you know, a score does not equate to a pain assessment. So that was a challenge for them. And then that brings me to the next slide, which is really their day-to-day -day struggles that they had. Uh, I can give you a couple of examples that I ran into. And, and one was that I had a nurse who had an order for PRN morphine. And at least she assessed her patient score, knew that they needed some pain control, checked the orders and saw that they had morphine ordered, but there was no frequency to it. So she came to me and she said, what do I do with this? Like, when do it, when is it okay to give it? Is it a big dose? Am I gonna cause them to stop breathing? I don't have monitors. I've got patients all over this ward. I'm not gonna be able to come back and check on them. So fear of, um, the opioid itself, just opioid phobia is a big thing. And I found fear of addiction to be a very common thread. I thought it was interesting that it was so um, frequent there. They had. So in that situation you do, you just wait until the end of the day when the physician comes around, that was unfortunate. In another situation, I had a patient that had the clofenac and paracetamol ordered, but not any opioids ordered and no one to advocate for that. And so what ends up happening is a patient with a major surgery ends up with pneumonia and that's very frustrating to the surgeon because it could have been prevented. And that's where a pain service or having a pain service nurse who can advocate in these situations, who can serve as a resource, who can add education for these nursing staff and provide them with the reassurance that they need would be so helpful for them. Um, so you have that fear of addiction, you have lack of order clarity, 
poor utilization of the medication sometimes when they're available to them. And another thing in working and holding in recovery, as, as their physician team begins to learn how to do more and more regional blocks, we don't need to forget how to educate the nursing staff on that in terms of their assessment and in educating the patients and families what to look for, whether they're going home or spending the night. Those nurses need to know how to assess for those patients and the complications that might, um, they might see from that. And then also they struggle with where to document those things. And they've since moved from paper to electronic documentation, I think in some areas since we were there. So I'm hoping that that too will provide some prompts for them and triggers in terms of when to assess and when to reassess. But that's a nutshell of kind of what I faced day to day with them when I was there and also just the global perspective of observations that I made. Um, and from that, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Dr. Sobey, where you can address some of the interventions that we're planning uh, for improvement. Great. Thank you so much, Twyla. And I can't express enough how integral Twyla really was to that nursing assessment and helping us to determine areas where we could intervene and potentially improve the overall process. So over the next six months, we met with all of the key stakeholders at the hospital to determine really how to best move forward. And we knew for it to be successful, we needed to have the local buy-in and input from all of the people that worked at Kajabi. And we were very fortunate enough to have those people. Steve Muchai, who has been mentioned previously, was really an integral part of all of this getting off of the ground. So we're very appreciative for him and all of the work that he and his colleagues have been able to do. And although we were able to observe the things on rounds and speak with some of the nursing staff, we knew we would need some baseline data. And that would be from our patients to learn about what the experience is at Kajabi and what the, their overall perception is of their pain management. And then we knew we needed to look at what the nursing knowledge was currently. And we also hoped to do a chart review. As Twyla mentioned, they did move from a paper electronic record to an electronic, or a paper record to an electronic medical, medical record, excuse me. So that did make that part challenging. And then we began to brainstorm about the different interventions and how we were going to implement the plan. We talked about education as one of our number one priorities. The Essentials of Pain Management course that Matt mentioned earlier will, earlier will be a cornerstone of this initiative. Um, Steve Muchai has actually already led one of those courses with plans to do that regularly throughout the year for the nursing staff. And then really, we thought that the creation of a pain service at Kajabi Hospital could serve to really oversee all of these initiatives and to serve as a point person for those that had questions about patient's pain management, whether it be intraoperatively or on the floor as well. And then the development of protocols and knowing that we may need to adjust the expectations of a protocol based on Kajabi's resources and things that are realistic to implement over time. And then of course, we would look at the outcomes once all of these things have been started. Um, we would again look at the patient experience following any sort of intervention, um, as well as the nursing attitudes and knowledge after these uh, educational courses and then hopefully look at the chart review to determine if we've made steps to pain assessment on the floor and also management in a timely fashion. So we first started developing the survey for the nurses. And this is a very common survey that's utilized. It's called the Nursing Knowledge and Attitude Survey regarding pain. Um, it, is an established, it has a established content validity by a panel of experts. Um, which was based on the American Pain Society, the World Health Organization, and the Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research Pain Management. Um, you do not need permission to utilize this survey, and it has been used for years um, in the U.S. and beyond as well to assess where a nurse's level of training is for pain management and assessment. Some of the questions that they look at, um, first of all, it assesses their level of training. It also looks specifically at their knowledge of pain recognition and different treatment modalities and it also assesses their recognition of addiction. Um, it also touches on some of the cultural considerations that they may need to be aware of when they're managing patients on the floor as well. So we had 50 nurses actually take this survey at Kajabi Hospital from the various post-operative wards, and um, the majority of the respondents were fairly new to practicing nursing. Um, they had been practicing for about three to five years, as Twyla mentioned earlier when she spoke to a lot of the nurses that we encountered. And these surveys are scored, and the average score for the survey for the 50 nurses that took this was just 24 out of 50. And um, there were several questions that were missed by a majority of the patients that, or the, the nurses that took the survey. And this really helped us to identify the areas of focus 
um, for future endeavors. And some examples of those is many believe that vital signs should be used to verify that a patient in, is in pain or that anxiolytics are acceptable to utilize as a first line for treatment of pain. And then other things that were missed just had to do with medication dosing and pharmacokinetics of the different analgesics that are available. And then we wanted to determine what the perception of the pain experience was for the patients at Kajabi. And we had two major components that we adapted from the brief pain inventory. So we had the patient scores and uh, the patient pain scores. We looked at their high and low pain scores. We looked at their pain at rest and movement and their overall satisfaction with the pain experience. Um, and we also looked at the incidence of nausea and vomiting. Um, some of the process items that we looked at to actually drive impro improvement were how often their pain was assessed by their bedside nurse. We also asked how often their pain was assessed by their surgical team that performed their operation. And then once they were assessed, we determined how long it took them to actually receive their treatment on the floor. And we also looked at pain interference items. This is commonly referred to as the quality of life. And so how does pain interfere with our patient's ability to sleep, with the patients at Kajabi's mood, um, their mobility, communication, and then their ability to enjoy life? So over a four-month period, 241 patients were surveyed. And the KRNAs at Kajabi, two of them worked to deliver these surveys to the patients. So we're, again, we're also very appreciative for the effort that everyone at Kajabi has put forward to make this possible. Um, the patients were surveyed twice, first on post-operative day one, and then on the day of discharge. And all of the surgical services that are performed at Kajabi were included. Um, OB, urology, orthopedics, plastics and ENT, and also general surgery. So I wanna briefly go over what we were able to find. Um, I'll briefly touch on the demographics. I love this graph on the left because it really shows the location that all of the patients that took the survey, where they came from. And you can see that patients truly come from all over Kenya to receive their care at Kajabi Hospital. And it really is a model institution for a low and middle income country. Um, when looking at the patient demographic or the patient demographics, um, it's very heavily female. And really it's because Kajabi has a very busy OB service. And you can see 89 respondents were from OB. Um, that also explains the discrepancy between the type of anesthesia administered. Um, there were 77 general anesthetics and 159 spinals attributed to the C-sections that are performed. But the next largest cohort that responded were from the orthopedic group, um, having orthopedic operations and then general surgery. And what we found from their results, this graph demonstrates patients that had a pain score of seven or higher at any point on their survey. So whether it was post-op day one or the day of discharge, and we categorize these patients as the high pain score groups. And although you can see in the blue, a majority of the patients reported pain scores below seven, 30% reported, almost 30% reported these higher pain scores. And when you looked at their pain interference scores, they also scored higher on these as well. So when, when patient's pain is not addressed, as we all know, it does affect their quality of life significantly, with it, which is really our driver for improvement for all of this. And not only that, the, as you would expect, patients that reported higher pain scores had a lower overall satisfaction with their pain management in the post-operative period. And for that high pain group that I mentioned, they were actually asked about their pain less by the bedside nurse. Um, and we're not really sure why at this point, something to definitely look into, but you wonder, are, were the patients considered more difficult and perhaps the nurses were avoiding asking them about their pain or their pain was just higher and so their, because their pain was never asked about and was not addressed. Um, but by far and large, the orthopedic surgical service had the highest post-operative day one maximum pain scores and also the highest low pain scores that were reported of any of our surgical groups. And this represents 38% of that high pain group, but only 31% of the total operations. And we wanted to break it down a little bit more to look at the larger cohorts. So we compared orthopedics to OB. And with orthopedic, orthopedics obviously appears to be our primary service for improvement, we really wanted to delve a little bit deeper. And so 
when we did compare it to OB, OB had, um, the orthopedic group had a worse pain score at day, uh, day one for their lowest pain, their pain at rest, and their pain with movement. And then when we looked and compared their pain interference scores, it was significant for higher pain interference for mood, mobility, and enjoyment when compared to the OB cohort. And there were a few explanations that might explain some of that with OB. First of all, a majority of the operations done with OB, of course, are for C-sections, and they receive spinal anesthetics that contain intrathecal morphine. So that is certainly an explanation for the post-operative day one pain scores in the first 24 hours. And another potential explanation for this is OB was one of the only services when we went through the wards and surveyed that already had some sort of post-operative protocol in place. And this is just an example over here that you can see, not just from an analgesic perspective, but from just an overall management perspective. They did have an order set for pain man med medications that were already ordered for each patient that received a C-section. And so for that, it is likely that those patients' pain was addressed more frequently than the orthopedic population. And given that, we wanted to uh, go ahead and compare orthopedics versus general surgery. Um, we found that the or orthopedic patients had a higher pain at discharge, at rest, and also with movement than the general surgery group did overall. And then we also found, again, that their pain interference scores, particularly in the areas of sleep, mobility, and enjoyment, um, were significantly higher in the orthopedic population versus the general surgery group. And so our initial conclusions were that the orthopedic population has really been identified as a high-risk group at Kajabi for poor pain control in the post-operative period. We dove a little deeper and looked that of only five of the orthopedic cases for the patients that took the survey received any sort of regional anesthesia outside of neuraxial anesthesia. So that identified an area for improvement for education for the providers at Kajabi as well for regional anesthesia. And um, we did decide that the orthopedic group would serve as our first targeted group for intervention. And after meeting again and coming up with a plan with the creation of the, the pain team and implementation of protocols that are applicable and reasonable for Kajabi, along with the pain education of the bedside nurses and anyone else interested, we believe that it would improve overall pain scores and pain interference scores in the orthopedic population. And with that, we have sort of a stepwise approach. First, it will be the creation and implementation of the pain management team at Kajabi, um, followed by development of protocols that are specific for Kajabi Hospital and the resources that are available. Um, that will also include regional anesthesia and the training thereof. Um, also, the regularly scheduled pain management seminars with the Essentials of Pain Management courses and then follow-up surveys to be distributed once all of this is complete and implemented. I wanted to update everyone on where we are now. Um, Steve Muchai is really leading the recruitment of a pain nurse now. The funding has already been approved for a pain nurse, which is a huge leap, and we're very grateful for him. He's trying to find the right person for that job as now. Um, as far as the protocols go, we are in the process of determining which surgical procedures that we would like to focus on, and also determining resources that would be available for protocol implementation. We will have to be aware of some of those limitations. They do have IV paracetamol. We can certainly utilize, but for example, they won't have IV toradol, but they do have diclofenac. So there are options for us to utilize other medications to still achieve the same goals. Um, certainly, the regional anesthesia education will be a large part of the implementation for these protocols. And um, for that, we anticipate certain limitations such as available staff to educate the KRNAs there. Um, it is dependent on what the expertise is of the, the anesthesiologist that may be present at Kajabi at any given time. Um, also supplies for performing nerve blocks can be a bit variable. And then um, medication availability as well. And as far as the education component, which will be a huge determinant, I, I believe, of the success of this to make sure that our nurses feel empowered to properly assess and manage patients on the floor um, will take place on a regular basis. Um, Steve Muchai assisted us in 
um, hosting one of these courses when we were there last June and he did an amazing job. And he will also um, start one of those courses at the end of this year. And we hope to set those in a regularly scheduled time frame. And then once all of that is complete, we will do our follow-up surveys um, to determine if, the, if we had any sort of improvement in the overall experience for that orthopedic cohort. And that is all I have. I just wanna say thank you and I'm gonna hand it back to Matt to sort of close everything out today. Thanks so much, Jenna. Um, so I'll just make a couple comments to close here, um, bringing us back out to the big picture. Um, yeah, as you may know, over the coming decades, there will be huge population growth in Africa and um, parts of the world um, that are considered lower middle income country. Uh, with that will come increased life expectancy and urbanization. Uh, with that as well will come increased healthcare and surgery needs. Um, as a, a healthcare community, as we address these, there will be a huge need for um, adequate pain control. Um, we've made some steps, you know, with our partners at Kajabi of addressing this, but what's happening at Kajabi Hospital will need to happen thousands of times across the continent and across the world to meet this growing demand. However, teamwork done right with a focus on creative solutions and data to demonstrate a difference can make this a reality. Um, many listening to this call are already aware of what it takes um, to work towards big goals in global health. Um, and when it comes to alleviating global pain and improving healthcare worldwide, now is the time together to make history. I do want to recognize some of our partners who have been involved in this work. Uh, Steve, who has already been mentioned. Um, Christian Pearson has been working through some of the data uh, with us. Um, and then the nurses who have been leading some of the education efforts there. Um, thank you all for listening. Um, we do have a couple of minutes for questions, but I do want to um, mention if Steve is still on the call, um, if he wants to say hello and make any comments, I want to give you an opportunity to do that, Steve. Uh, uh, greetings to all of you, and uh, a pleasure to be here. I'm so happy that you invited me uh, to attend uh, this meeting today. Um, Thank you so much. I think we'll continue working together to help improve the quality of our patient care here in Kijabe. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. You're an incredible leader there at Kijabe um, and in the region for anesthesia education and, and now pain management. Keep up the great work. Uh, thank you. Good. Well, we'll open it up for any questions um, over the next couple of minutes. So Matt, Jenna, and Twyla, um, fantastic job at the presentation. You guys certainly do incredible work for us uh, on the pain service and at the Children's Hospital. Um, and I think taking your skills and knowledge and uh, enthusiasm overseas to, to really build a pain service uh, is, is really inspirational for me and I know several of, of us on this call today. Uh, so thank you, first of all. Um, I think you guys have made a huge uh, difference for the care overseas and will continue to do great work overseas for sure. Um, I guess my question is, is you know, given the amount of time that you guys have spent in uh, these uh, LMICs, how has that changed your perspective on how care is practiced over here? And do you have a different viewpoint on how we practice uh, pain morning. management here given your time overseas? Well, I think you mentioned a little bit about that. Do you want to expand on that to start? Yeah, sure. I, I do feel like for me, I, I think that was uh, one of the big things I took away. And, and I know it's a mission-minded hospital, but they do put a lot of focus on the spiritual care. And in, in chronic pain, as you know, Dr. Franklin, from even from clinic, you know, those kids don't have a lot of psychological support sometimes, and, and the spiritual support is not in place. They don't have good... Um, home structures. And so uh, I feel like that is something for us that we can certainly be mindful to focus on and bringing in uh, that side of things to the care that we deliver at Vanderbilt Children's Hospital. Good, Twilight. Jenna, you want to mention something? 
I think it has really helped to um, just improve, enhance my ability to set expectations for our patients on a daily basis. And, you know, really have that conversation prior to anything that happens to make sure that they are aware of, of what they're going to experience and they're aware that we are going to be there for them to help to get through that. So I think expectations um, has been one of the major changes that I've had since I've come back. Good, and, and I'll just comment too, you know, one of the things for anybody who's spent some time at Kajabi or some of these other settings that comes across is the um, uh, ability to be creative in making good use of what you have. Um, here at Vanderbilt, uh, we have an abundance of resources, but occasionally you come across situations where there's not a clear path forward. Um, and working in a place like Kajabi has helped me to see um, the value of thinking creatively, thinking outside of the box, thinking about how we could try something new or something, something that hasn't been done before to address uh, challenges that come our way. Um, thanks for the question, Drew. Um, Jim has a, a question on the chat about uh, Dexter and Methorphan, which Looks great. I mean, it seems like something that would be um, more accessible than some of the more expensive, fancier drugs. And, and I think that illustrates the point of, uh, in some of these instances, it takes a lot to, to be creative. Jenna had a slide um, that showed a couple of buretrols. And in order to make a ketamine and lidocaine infusion for a patient that we were dealing with uh, when I was there last year, we, uh, we kind of did a makeshift version um, and were able to, to help, help out a patient um, who was undergoing a major surgery um, and couldn't get another intervention. Um, so Jim, I think that's a great example of, of thinking about uh, uh, other ways to accomplish what we want to do. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think that they are currently using that, but that is certainly something that, um, that creative thinking I think is what leads to the success of all of these initiatives. You know, we, they don't have the normal medications that we have and we have to find ways to achieve the same goal. And I think it can be done. I mean, they've proven that it can be, so. Dr. Newton mentioned a, a question on the chat about the need for regional anesthesia education in Kenya and LMICs in general um, and uh, how that relates to staff and stuff. So from a staff perspective, um, there is a desire to utilize these. I think appreciation for the value of better pain control, of persistent pain control as patients go to the wards where there may not be great monitoring or nursing care um, is there. Um, but the educators are scarce um, and some of the tools are scarce. Kajabi is better resourced with ultrasounds and needles. Many places that's not the case, but it could be with advocacy and funding in that direction. Um, it is an opportunity for many of us here who have these skills um, to either from a distance learning perspective or going in person to some of these settings, help establish uh, the skills and uh, reinforce the desire to, um, to do regional anesthesia in a good way because of the high value that it can provide. I think monitoring is another thing that we have to consider for, for some of those patients in the post-operative period as well in regards to regional anesthesia, um, just to ensure that those systems are in place. Yeah, I would agree with that. And certainly making sure, as we pointed out, that nursing or, or nursing, nursing education needs to happen in that setting as well. Um, it's, it's good to teach how it's done, but you also have to teach the follow-up and how to assess after the fact. And so having someone there that can, can help with that is, is pivotal as well. Good, y'all. Well, it is approaching 730. Um, really appreciate you being a part of this conference. Um, happy to follow up with any other questions that um, haven't been addressed. And hope you all have a great day. Thank you all. Thanks, Steve. It's yeah. so good to see you. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you so much.